but hey everyone thank you so much for tuning into this session today i am Emily Viviani, CCL's Social Content Manager. And in this discussion, we're talking with our senior faculty, Princess Cullum, and our Director of Client Solutions, Catherine Papa, about ways that you can enhance the leadership outcomes of your, of your team by using our Direction, Alignment, and Commitment, or DAC model. So um, that's going to be a really powerful conversation. And actually, midway through, we're going to take a quick break and allow you the chance to complete a quick self-assessment that will enable you to understand where you should focus the efforts on your team going forward. So that will be about 45 minutes into the discussion, um, give or take. If you've not yet already, I really encourage you to download the conference resources that are linked, that are available through the Get Tick Tickets link at the top of this page. That's where the assessment that we're going to encourage you to take is located. Um, so more on that later. Uh, in the meantime, I want to give Catherine and Princess a chance to introduce themselves, provide a little bit more information about their background and an overview of what we're going to be covering today. So thank you guys for joining us. I will hand it over to you. Outstanding. Thank you so much, Emily. And good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. We're delighted to have you with us. Um, my name is Catherine Papa, and I am the Director of Client Solutions at CCL. I have a variety of responsibilities, including being a faculty in our classrooms and working with our clients. Um, and uh, let's see, I'm working from home like a lot of people have a husband and two teenage daughters and a couple of labradoodles. Um, and so we are making the best of it at home this summer. Um, and I have actually been at CCL for 32 years. I can't believe it. Um, with, um, I, I will just say that I started at the age of 12 and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> uh, that's my story. I'm sticking to it. Uh, mm -hmm. Princess, how about you? Thank you, Catherine. I'm so happy to be here today with everyone and my friends, Emily and Catherine. Uh, I am what's considered to be a short timer, I guess, at the center because I haven't been there as long as some of my colleagues. But I am a leadership solutions partner. And what that means is I partner with our clients, helping them with their custom solutions to really drive leadership effectiveness at their company. I um, have two, excuse me, three daughters, and a husband, and we live in the great state of North Carolina. And we can't wait to get engaged with all of you guys today. So with that, why don't we go ahead and get started? Let's talk about how we can get engaged. Today, we are going to go through our agenda and we're going to talk about all the things that are really important to looking at leadership as a social process. We're also gonna apply an effective approach to enhance leadership outcomes. We call that direction, alignment, and commitment. We're gonna assess how well leadership is happening in your group. And then we're going to identify some actions that you can take to improve your leadership outcomes. So with that, I hope we're ready to rumble. What do you think, Catherine? Are you ready to go? We are ready to rumble. Get, go for it, Princess. Let's go for it. All right. Well, in a few minutes, we're going to ask you guys to share your own experience. But before we do that, I would like to share an experience of my own. So on the next slide, as we talk about the experiences we want to share, let me tell you about a little one that I was involved in. So I was working with a healthcare executive and we were working with a new hospital. We'd been open about six months and we were having some growing pains, Catherine. And what I mean by that is our engagement scores were tanking. Yeah. We decided to focus on our manager of others population, which was about 93% new and managed over 85% of all our stakeholders. We were excited about the direction that we were moving forward in. But with that, probably enough about me. Now it's your turn. Next slide, I'd like you to think about a time when you were part of a group or a team and one or more of these statements were particularly true. Maybe you use mine and that is we were excited about where we were headed. Or perhaps your truth is that you found your purpose. Maybe you were all new, your roles and responsibilities. Maybe you, your work fit seamlessly, seamlessly together or you were committed to one another. Everyone felt responsible for the work might be the direction that you guys were headed in. All that sounds great, but I'd like to learn a little bit more about the group that you were actually working with. So on the next slide, I got a couple more questions to dig in a little bit more. Can you tell me about the group? 
You know, what were you working on? What achieving this outcome look like? As you're thinking about that, please take a minute to go into the chat and answer this question. What contributed the most to the, to the group achieving these outcomes? So what do you think it was? As you guys are taking a minute to enter in the chat, I'm gonna to turn to Catherine and we're going to, to talk a little bit about, you know, maybe some groups that we worked on where we felt like the outcomes were being achieved. Catherine, do you have anything in mind that you're thinking of while we're waiting on things to come through in the chat? Absolutely. So I'm gonna I'm gonna call back to our colleague Ann Creedy who uh, preceded us in this conference. And I, um, I had not heard her tell the story that concluded with we, CCL, were, were born for this moment. Mm. That, is a, um, uh, that is a statement that I can get inspired about um, mm. and engaged about, even as a 32-year employee and having yeah. seen all the changes you know, all of our organizations, including the Center for Creative Leadership, are undergoing rapid and unchartered change right now. Yeah. And so what we're going to be sharing today is going to be some stuff that might help reframe for people the way that Anne's uh, comment even reframe for me. CCL was born for this moment. Yeah, I can appreciate that. Looks like we have some comments rolling in here. Somebody just talked about common purpose. I definitely can. Um, I share that, you know, while working at a, at a hospital, we had a common purpose of making sure that we delivered the very best care to our patients, as I mentioned before. I also see someone talking about having a defined and clear goal is something that helped them to achieve their goals. I see a comment about trust and mm -hmm. trust is so important. And I'll speak to that a little bit, probably in about 10 or 12 minutes, we'll be talking right. about the commitment portion of this, uh, of this um, model and trust is a critical element yeah. in creating commitment among people. I totally agree. It seems like that trust and communication has come up a lot. I see yeah. it a lot, yes. Well, you know what, um, this is all great and this is all terrific, but I'm wondering if we shift gears a little bit, mm -hmm. I'd like to go to the next slide. And on this next slide, I'm gonna ask them to think about another group, right? For the rest of the activities, I want them to think about a specific project that they were either leading or a part of <laughs> that just didn't achieve the optimal results that you wanted to. This could be a business, a family, a team, social or societal. Um, we want you to hold that group in mind. And as we go through the day, maybe you'll get some ideas of how you could remedy it. And if you are so inclined, we're going to challenge you even to think about yourself personally. Maybe you could think of your own individual challenge that you might want to look at as we go through the day's session. So with that in mind, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to my esteemed colleague, Catherine. Excellent. Thank you so much, Princess. Um, we can switch to the next one. I'm not sure if Emily or Eric is running the show, but Emily or Eric, if you could. And I'm actually, let's see. Yeah, I'll, uh, if you'll go to the next slide, please. Um, so this notion of leadership one of the things that we like to do at CCL is kind of reframe mm -hmm. um, how leaders think about themselves um, and the behavior of leadership and, mm -hmm. and really the social process of leadership is where we're headed. Um, so many of us um, have grown up with thoughts of kind of the great leader and leadership being resident in a person. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that we loved you to think about is leadership being really a process mm -hmm. that happens among people who are invited into leadership um, and that it, it creates some collective results that are super effective and actually much better than any one even fabulous leader can produce. So mm -hmm. I'd love to review the three components that we feel are both contributors to and outcomes when leadership is present. So the first one here is direction. And it means exactly what you think it means. Um, so it is about uh, an organization or a team or a business or even an individual or a family or a movement saying we're headed north. Um, we are, this is the direction in which we're going. 
And so all kinds of things fall out of that, right? So we've got a vision. We have a vision of where we're headed. Uh, your mission statement. So John Ryan talked about CCL's mission statement, benefit of society worldwide, improving leadership for the benefit of society worldwide. Um, strategy. So all of these things line up to give us collectively that direction of where we're headed. And so this mm -hmm. is both a contributing factor to leadership and results, and it is an outcome of that social process of leadership. Um, the other thing that I'll offer you is that when we do direction right, um, it helps us decide what to say yes and no to. Mm -hmm. um, so if you think about uh, going to an art gallery um, and there are all kinds of works of arts that somebody could put on the wall to, um, um, to add to whatever the show is, but you kind of pick and choose which ones fit together into a cohesive narrative. Direction's gonna help you do that. Um, it's gonna help you decide what you do and what you don't. And so even Princess and I, as we worked this, Princess will remember, we've kind of gone back and forth yeah. about what should even be in this uh, presentation. Right. We have so much stuff we could be talking about. <laughs> But we had to get clear about what is it that we want you all to walk away with. And then we had to leave some stuff on the cutting room floor. We had to leave some works of art out of the presentation in order to accomplish that. So I think direction tells you just as much what to say no to as it does to what to say yes to. Then the second component, Princess, did you want to jump in? No, I, I think you're totally right. I think direction is that, that thing. I have to think about it as an individual, I'll kind of chime in on that. I often think of direction as when you're in your thinking part, right? And you're thinking about what you want to do and what you want to have happen and the goals that you want to achieve. Um, yeah. I kind of stay in that space when I'm in that. So I totally agree with you. Yep. Excellent. All right. So the next component is alignment. So we've set this direction. How do we align and coordinate the the work of the group in service of that direction. Um, I can actually tell kind of a negative story where I see we work with organizations, clients, businesses, and individual leaders all the time mm -hmm. when people have set a new direction, but their budget mm -hmm. and or their structure, how they've got their resources organized, um, absolutely uh, doesn't necessarily align with the new direction. It's reflective of a strategy, a, a, you know, maybe a, maybe the last strategy or even a strategy before that. Mm -hmm. and so what you see is that the organization or the business takes longer to get where they think they wanted to go. Mm -hmm. And they might even have some false starts al along the way. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, I totally agree with you. I mean, I've seen that, especially when leadership has already been working on a change for a long time. And so they're already into the next step of implementing it, but sometimes forget that their team is now just learning about that change and they have to wait for them to just catch up. And so, again, you kind of see that start and stop happening that there's not alignment in that. Exactly. The um, So I, I, I saw one of the comments that uh, flashed up that this could be used not only in business, but individually. So you can think about your vision for yourself. And if you change that vision, how do you need to realign even your own thinking? Yeah. It, really, the, the unit of focus for this model could be everywhere from individually. What are you trying to uh, create to um, to even uh, societal movements mm -hmm. um, and and how do you align resources toward that direction in order to accomplish that specific okay. direction? Right. Let me um, let me move on to the next slide because this is actually one of my favorite ones to talk about, and that is commitment, and that's mutual responsibility for the group. So you can have all the great direction in the world. We're going north. And then we can have all of our resources aligned, but then it's critical that we get commitment from the people who are helping to um, organize and move that direction forward, that we get their commitment. 
Um, I love the phrase around discretionary effort that everyone shows up at work. Most everyone shows up <laughs> at work um, really wanting to do a good job and um, do well enough that they can continue doing that good job. But everybody has that little bit of extra, extra effort that they could bring if they are committed to the cause. And leaders who can tap into that discretionary effort, a leadership process, a group that can tap into that discretionary effort um, will perform so much better, even if it's just the smallest degrees of additional effort that you can tap into. So when I think about commitment, I like to think about um, commitment on a continuum. So if you if you look at a continuum, then you've got on one end, you've got um, full commitment, full engagement. You've got um, uh, you've got access to that discretionary effort. If we move down the continuum about midway, you might have what we call compliance and compliance is I'm going to I'm going to do what you have suggested I do because you suggested I do it, because you are my boss, because you are in a position of power, et cetera. Um, and sometimes that's OK, but there are there are more times than not that if you can get someone's full uh, commitment, um, that you can access that additional effort and do even a better job. Um, but I told you that was a midpoint. Um, on the other end is what I like to affectionately refer to as malicious compliance where people will do exactly what you ask them to do and not what they know you intended that they do. Um, so uh, I'm going to tell a story on my girls um, because they're teenagers. I told you they were teenagers um, and um, not all teenagers uh, demonstrate malicious compliance. Um, but they tend to be really good uh, practitioners at times. It's completely developmentally appropriate, right? Teenagers are kind of separating from their parents and establishing their own identity. So frequently I will have my girls will be, they're very big into musical theater. And so they'll be watching musical theater right now. Unfortunately, it's on TV. Um, so they're watching musical theater. They'll be engrossed and I can walk through and say, Hey, can you, I, I, can you, I think the dishwasher just finished. Can you check and see if the dishes are clean? And they're engrossed and they're irritated that I'm asking them to do something. And so I have to come back through and ask a couple of times. And so they might go to the dishwasher at some point, malicious compliance, and open the dishwasher and go, yep, those dishes are clean. And they close the dishwasher and they go back to musical theater. Uh, and so then I might uh, go later and say, hey, it looks like the dishes are still in the dishwasher. What happened? Oh, you want us to unload the dishwasher? See, all you did was tell us to check to see if they were clean. So clearly, as a mother, I am not doing a great job building commitment in my teenagers. Um, and giving them room to be uh, maliciously compliant. And so what we want to do is tell stories and create a social process that allows commitment to happen. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm sure that uh, princesses' children are much different than mine and much better behaved. Totally not. I can, I can even tell you, Catherine, I have gone as far as, let's say my example is, putting away the clothes after I've washed them, I have gone so far as to take the basket of clothes and to sit it out in front of them so that they trip over it um, to get to the stairs, to go upstairs, and still they will walk around those and say, well, yeah, did you see the clothes? Yeah, I saw them. Yeah, they're, they're at the bottom of the stairs. <laughs> yeah, exactly, which I think actually tees us up nicely for what we're getting ready to talk about. <laughs> but, um, uh, let me have you go to the next. Absolutely. So direction, alignment, commitment, that those are conditions for performance to happen. And when we see good leadership happen, we see direction, alignment and commitment. Um, I see a lot of people. Elizabeth, thank you. The struggle is real. Um, excellent. Uh, so, uh, Princess, let me hand it back to you. Well, you know what? I have been a part of a couple of teams myself where I have 
I have to say, there's been a couple of components that have been missing, right? You may have direction and commitment, but you don't have alignment. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you a little bit, Catherine, right. as we talked about all these different examples where things work out really well. And then we start to get into a little bit about what happens if we're on a little bit of a swing on the pendulum. I like to really dive into what happens when a component is actually missing, right? So let me ask you a question. What happens if we go to the next slide? What happens if you have direction and commitment, but you have low alignment, what does that look like? Yeah, so um, this it, this ties back a little bit to what I was saying earlier when an organization or a business charts a new course and sets a new strategy, that's the direction component, mm -hmm. and everybody is rah, rah on board, and so they're, 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 they're fully committed and willing to bring their best. Um, if alignment is missing, then you're going to get a you get you're going to get only gradual change because people don't have the structure and the resources to move that forward, and or um, you're going to get a, just a bunch of false starts. And you're going to get as as leaders, we wonder why isn't this going anywhere? Mm -hmm. um, I have um, uh, good friends in Charlottesville, Virginia, in the United States who own a beautiful restaurant. Um, and um, as you might imagine, uh, this is uh, COVID has been devastating mm -hmm. for them. Um, and so they have had to reset the direction and they have their lovely people. I'm biased. They're my friends, but they're lovely people. And so their staff has been fully committed, showing up sometimes even when they are not paid to help with the new takeout business but it was slow to start because of the um the the realignment right. that Farrell and Angelo needed to do with their resources to go from this beautiful kind of um high end uh um Angela has been recognized by the James Beard Foundation, wow. high end, beautiful restaurant to a, a, a kind of a comfort food. Mm. Um, uh, it's Greek comfort food. Uh, I promise you, I'm not doing a plug. Um, <laughs> but you are making me hungry. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that but that's a big change in direction. They made they committed to it. And they had the commitment to do it, but there was all kind of, it was a little bit of a slow start because they had to reconfigure everything to do that. Yeah, I can appreciate, yeah, I can I can appreciate that. I'll, I'll go back and tease up uh, the healthcare example that I talked about earlier, mm -hmm. where we were focused on working on our manager of others. So we clearly had direction. Um, as a hospital, we we are all about our patients and being committed to our patients. But were we were we aligned? Did we have that alignment? Well, we found out that we didn't. You know, as we rolled out the program, we had different uh, our hospital sites that were deciding to implement certain parts of the program and not others. Um, they were even deciding that they didn't want to focus on the managers of others. They wanted to, you know, they had a bigger need for focusing in on their uh, mid-level leaders. And yeah. so they decided to invite everyone to the program. And I'm sure nobody else on the call has ever had that happen. When you no, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm certain of it. <laughs> Never happened at all. Well, then there's other ways that components can be missing. So, Catherine, I'm going to ask you to go ahead and tee up the next one, which is what happens when you are missing in a different area. Yeah, so there's the... We've got direction and alignment, but low commitment. Mm -hmm. um, and so this might happen. So we're coordinated, we're facing the same way, but we're lacking energy. Mm -hmm. um, so this might happen when um, an organization chooses a different direction and aligns their resources accordingly, but they haven't invited the people into that process and the, and their colleagues don't see themselves reflected in the in, in the end and, and really this is while the center for creative leadership has all kinds of uh programs and workshops and publications at the end of the day human beings want to be in, invited to be engaged mm -hmm. um, and to bring that discretionary effort and so one of the important things is to make sure that you include people in the process so that they see their voices represented and um, and can then have that commitment. Now, now, it very well could be that people are not 
um, people don't agree with the new direction, but being clear about all of that gives people the chance to make some informed choices right. about staying and um, some informed choices if that's not the place for them so that we can get people who are in fact committed. Um, if you don't have that commitment, then yeah. you do get that compliance or mm -hmm. malicious compliance um, that may not only slow you down, but it may derail things. Right. So I'm I'm reminded of the article. Um, it's a classic article, and I cannot remember the original um, author about passive aggressive organizations, where everybody's in the room and everybody smiles and says yes, and of course we're on board, and they leave the room and they have no intention of right. implementing what they're what they're going to do. Right. No, I totally agree. I think even that trust component that you talked about earlier really yeah. feeds into yeah. Yeah. commitment. You know, I can think of a time, uh, you know, when we were standing up a leadership academy and we all knew the direction we wanted to go into. We all knew our roles and responsibilities. We had individual programs that we were launching as part of the academy, but we would make promises to the other members that were launching or standing up their programs. Mm -hmm. And then if times got tough or if we really needed to focus on our own programs, through with some of those processes, yeah. some of those promises. And so it was it was a mess, right? And so that happens sometimes too if the culture doesn't really support one of trust. Exactly. Exactly. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn to the very last one, um, what, what the components are missing. And that is when you have alignment and commitment but no direction. Mm -hmm. And in that case, you know, people are willing to cooperate, um, but the purpose is unclear. There's a lack of agreement on priorities. People feel pulled in different directions and they're committed, but they don't know what efforts to have. And, and unfortunately, I have a kind of a sad story to share with this one. And that is when I was involved in a, involved in a board uh, for a nonprofit. And of course, we, we had alignment on what our roles were. We were all committed to the goals of the organization. But as a board, a couple years in, we just couldn't kind of get aligned on what priorities we had for the organization. And it, it really... Uh, deterred, us from, deterred us from being able to get financial support. And the organization suffered as a result of it. So this can happen in for-profit, non-for-profit organizations. It doesn't matter. Absolutely. The, um, you know, when, when I work with clients, the, uh, I, I see this frequently, um, but especially when an organization is, is as you described, a non-profit I see it in churches and synagogues and mosques, um, uh, organizations where lots of committed people yes. with, sometimes with resources, sometimes not with, <laughs> not with resources, yeah. uh, are coming together around a cause. But one of the challenges when you bring together people who have all these different ideas about what's important for us and what's the most kind of what's the essence of a cause right that people have different definitions in their head of what the cause really is yes and so you end up with fragmented effort mm -hmm. um, because everybody thinks they're in agreement about the direction but there's but there's but everybody has slightly different interpretations of that direction and and Absolutely, this happens in for-profit organizations as well. And I think sometimes when you have such um, strong alignment and commitment, it can really you can um, you can move forward for a while on that, right? Just on that adrenaline, adrenaline of the alignment and the commitment, and then sometimes then it starts to fall, and you wonder why, and it's because that direction is lacking. So I totally can see that as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we we're seeing some of that right now with the disruption that COVID is creating for not only our businesses, but our families and our society, um, because the direction that, we can argue whether the direction was working all that well before on a whole variety of topics, mm -hmm. but at least we knew how to move in that direction, through that direction, um, but all of that's kind of been exploded. Yeah. Um, with COVID and everything's back up for renegotiation. So, I mean, you can drill this down to even as, as simple as a family unit and, yes. and 
if we had established patterns and ways of being with one another, whether it was effective or not, that was a direction. And now that we're all together in the same small space, um, that changes, potentially either changes the direction of the, our family agreements, um, or at least it causes us to need to renegotiate those. Yeah, I can see that. I can also see that what's going on right now with some of the societal issues that we're dealing with all around the world, where people, again, are very aligned and they're very committed and compassionate uh, about the topic. But what's the direction that we're all moving in? Can you get different people with different agendas to all move in one direction? So I can see that going on from a societal standpoint right now as well. It, absolutely. It, it's happening everywhere, isn't it? It is. Um, uh, let me go to the next slide, which I think is just a summary of the three areas, which it is. Um, I'm, I'm thinking we go to uh, questions. Um, so let's see. Uh, let's see. And let's, let's stop here and uh, let's see what questions we have. I see a question about, as a leader, how do I get my team to move from compliance to mm. commitment? Um, gosh, it, uh, it, isn't that the million dollar question? Um, what I would suggest is um, to, to engage your team in a conversation about the direction, what's going well, what's not going well. And then one of my favorite things to do is ask appreciative inquiry questions. So um, if as an organization, as a, let me do this, as a team, since you're asking a question about a team, as a team, if you were to be able to say six months from now that we were performing better as a team, what would we be doing differently? What would we be doing more of? What would we have stopped doing? Um, and sometimes the, I'll say sometimes just asking the question and yeah. signaling that you care can make a huge difference by itself. Yes. And then listening to those responses, uh, we talk to people all the time about, you know, their team wishes that, um, you as a leader would do more delegation. Um, and people leave our programs and go home and do something that maybe wasn't quite what their team intended them to do. And so how do you go back and go, all right, six months from now, if you were able to say that I was delegating better, what would that look like? Um, I, I think asking some of those appreciative inquiry questions and then yeah. really listening to the responses not only moves people from compliance to commitment, but builds some of that trust that was mentioned earlier in thinking about those groups that worked really well together and, and inspired some of the the quotes that Princess's slide had. Princess. Oh, no, I appreciate that. And I, I think I want to also switch to maybe a question that someone has. I see someone coming through that wants us to um, de define alignment again um, and how it's different from direction. Um, so when you think about alignment, alignment really is the coordination of all the efforts. Direction is the focus that you're moving into or the outcome that you want to achieve. So you're focused and you agree upon an outcome that you're moving forward. And then to align, you coordinate all your efforts so that all those are working together. So it's like putting all the fingers together in one big fist to move forward as opposed to those moving in different directions. So hopefully that helps to differentiate the difference between those two. The, let me jump in and I'll add. So one of the clients that we're working with right now, so I gave the example of um, my friend's restaurant. Mm -hmm. um, there's another example. We've got a, um, we're working with a client who is a manufacturer uh, and there was no demand for the, what they were manufacturing. Mm -hmm. um, and so come March and April, they flipped to making personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, for our healthcare workers. Mm -hmm. um, so, so imagine we've made a decision. We've, we've chosen a direction of, we are going to uh, make, um, we are going to make 
uh, personal protective equipment, PPE. Mm-hmm. But, but we leave the we leave the manufacturing line making. I'm going to make this up. Paper cups. Um, okay. Like you, that's a problem. It is. That's a problem. <laughs> and so that's an alignment problem. Our direction is PPE. Mm-hmm. Our manufacturing line is for paper cups. That that's how I might distinguish that. I think that's great. Someone else asked about the the hierarchy of DAC. You know, like does one need to come first or the other? Um, and I, I'll give my opinion, Catherine. Love to hear yours. Yeah. I don't think it's an, an either or, or that it's a step that one has to happen. Then there's two, and there's three. It's really that secret space or that secret sauce. We like to say we're all three come together. And so I think you you start where you are. And if your organization has direction and it has alignment but doesn't have commitment, then you work on the commitment piece or, you know, any other different combination. So I don't think it's a sequence as much as it is. You're looking for that space where all three of them are happening together. What do you think, Catherine? hundred percent. So it um, it's a really helpful. So we're talking about direction, alignment, commitment as outcomes mm-hmm. of successful leadership of this social process that we're doing together. I think it is also a helpful diagnostic. And so in some ways, that's what we're talking about here, right? Right. Uh, It's a helpful diagnostic to say, if things are not happening the way you think they might, what, what, what are the levers that might be missing? Um, And I remember an earlier question, um, it's, uh, it's moved up in the feed, but it caught my attention. Do you need to have all three Mm-hmm. before you start answer no and, <laughs> good luck with you if you have that one i want to hear about that story no, okay. <laughs> yeah write the book let us know <laughs> come on down to cco <laughs> exactly <laughs> got to talk for you uh, definitely so you don't have to have all three you don't even have to, you, you know when you start i mean I, I you know i think getting started is the key and then continually emerging your analysis of, okay, what, what do we need more of and what's not happening? Therefore, where might I put, if I have an extra hour, 30 minutes, yeah. 50 minutes, five minutes today, um, and things are not happening as well as I think they might, where might I put that time right. um, to try and advance uh, the outcomes? Yeah, yeah. I feel like um, saying, ooh, 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 because there's a question on here I just really want to bring up. So someone says, how can I bring up DAC to my senior leaders without insulting them by implying that their leadership (laughs) isn't working? Is that a good one or not? That's a great one. That's a really good one. I can't wait to hear what you say. We have another great model called SBI, Situation, Behaviors, and Impact. (laughs) That's a great (laughs) tool that we can use for feedback. (laughs) That's a different session. Uh, I think it does come back to what can you own, right? What's in your sphere of influence? So maybe using yourself as an example and working with your team and then being able to share that example with your leadership team that you or yourself maybe was experiencing, you know, direction. You had uh, alignment, but you were missing commitment. So this is what happened in our case. You know, this is something I might even see going on in the whole organization and then enlisting their input. So I think always starting with yourself and what you can control, modeling that behavior. And we can model behaviors up as well as down in our organization. Yep, absolutely. I'm um, I'm reminded of uh, also Barry Oshry's work in mm-hmm. systems leadership. Um, our, uh, um, uh, one of our flagship programs, the leadership development program includes the organizational workshop yes. where um, we look at what it, what it feels like to be at different levels of the organization. So, so I think the caution with which our question comes is a good one. Yes. Um, you have to do that with, with skill and political savvy, right? Yes. Um, and just to recognize that our senior most leadership, um, it, it, it feels like in any organization, by the way, including CCL, it feels like they're constantly just arrows coming at them yes. from all directions. And so one of the ways in which we might ask a question or talk about direction alignment commitment to our senior leaders is to also bring some options for solutions. Mm-hmm. I've, I've, I've watched this happen. Yes. I think this is the consequence to our organization. 
and I'd love to be a part of the solution. And here's some ideas that I have. Yes. And then to also recognize that they might be so busy and strapped for time um, that you might have to repeat that a couple of times gently and with lots of EQ. Yes. Um, but at CCL, being a 32 year employee at CCL, I like to say it's like throwing spaghetti at the wall. And so every once in a while I get some ideas and or I've had ideas for years and I'll throw spaghetti at the wall. I'll bring my idea forward and it might not stick. It might slide on down that wall and I go, all right, it's not time for that one yet. <laughs> Pack it away in my files. And then I, I wait for the right opportunity and I bring it back out and I throw that spaghetti against the wall and it slides on down the wall. Okay, not quite time, but but over time, especially if you take the um, a, a long view um, and you maintain that commitment that requires you to do some investment in your own commitment, mm -hmm. which I think ties back to resilience mm -hmm. and burning bright rather than burning out mm -hmm. um, that uh, John Ryan talked about right at the beginning, okay. that all of that plays into successfully being at, able to advocate for direction alignment commitment from your senior leaders. Yeah, I can so appreciate that. And, that, and thinking about the whole organizational workshop, there's another question that I think would fit into this as well. And they say, as a mid-level leader, how do I keep my team moving forward and motivate it towards an agreed upon direction when senior leadership has checked out? Mm. And that's that hole in the middle, right? Where you're in the middle and, and you're looking at bottoms and you're looking at tops, you're torn, right? Because you're hearing things coming down from the top, things coming up from the bottom, and you have a tendency to hold on to those and to intervene and to act upon them as opposed to moving them to where they need to be, right? If it's something that needs to be addressed by senior leadership, moving it up senior leadership over something that needs to be addressed at the bottom, moving it down to the bottom, but kind of taking yourself out as the answer to that particular problem. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, and also um, uh, John Ryan, actually John Ryan would be perfectly fine with me saying, I'm kind of a, a beg forgiveness rather than ask permission person. And when we work with the C-suite, when we work with senior leaders, more often than not, not all the time, not every time, but with great regularity, yes. uh, we hear from senior leaders that they are really interested with in their uh, middle and frontline leaders uh, doing more proactive things mm -hmm. rather than waiting to be told, rather than um, checking in to make sure something's okay. There's so much that needs to happen. They're yes. delighted to have people move forward. No, I've experienced that myself where it's, it's almost been um, where the leadership team, the senior leadership team is expecting that to happen and the mid-level leaders are asking for permission. There's this total disconnect um, of why they're asking for permission when they already have the authority and responsibility to move forward. So I think, again, just modeling that behavior is perfect. Absolutely. I am seeing a um, question about uh, SBI, situation behavior impact. I know that after the break, and after everyone completes what I think is a really handy direction alignment commitment assessment, we're going to have additional question time. Princess and I love to answer your questions kind of live and extemporaneously. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll have an opportunity and I'm making a note to come back and um, just give the, the, the quickest tour of situation behavior impact, which is our model around delivering uh, developmental feedback to our colleagues. Awesome. Wonderful. Thank you, uh, Princess and Catherine, so much for uh, the first half of this great session. I was going to say, Catherine, it seems like there's a lot of enthusiasm for us to go through that SBI model. So hopefully in the second half of this presentation, um, we can do that. But right now, I'm going to pull up a slide um, to have up here with specific directions uh, to, to be on the screen during the break. But we really encourage you to, if you've not yet already, download our conference resources. You can do that. There's a little 
handy little picture in, on this slide of where you click the URL to download those resources. On page 29 of that resource booklet, there is an assessment that looks like this, and I'll post the screenshot um, right on this slide. <laughs> but it's gonna enable you to uh, get a number value for the levels that you think your team is currently at, um, direction, alignment, and commitment wise. So I know I'm planning to take the assessment and hopefully um, lean into Catherine and Princess's wisdom in what I should do next um, with my team to the viewer who asked what's a great way to bring this up, printing out these assessments for your team to take as a group and have a conversation about yeah. it is a great way to spark a conversation around this concept within your own teams. So um, thank you, Catherine and Princess, again. Uh, this is a really helpful session. I know when I started at CCL and this idea of direction alignment commitment um, was introduced to me the visual of direction alignment and commitment being the the legs of a stool was how it was explained to me, which I think right. is a yeah. powerful yeah. illustration. Um, you know, a, a, you can't sit on a stool that doesn't have all three legs. So um, <laughs> with that, I'll give the viewers who are tuning in a chance to access those resources, take this quick assessment and meet us back here if you're in the Eastern time zone right around 1130 or 30 minutes past the hour, wherever you are. Um, we are looking forward to continuing the conversation then. See y'all in a few. Bye-bye.
Hey everyone, hopefully you've all had a chance to find that assessment and complete it for your team. Um, I feel very fortunate that I am going to get to learn from uh, Catherine and Princess uh, for the, the results of my personal assessment. I am on the content marketing team at CCL. So um, I, I, filled, I filled mine out over the break. So uh, Catherine and Princess, thanks so much for making time to go through those results with me. Oh, no worry at all. Before we jump into that, I had a funny thing happen during the break. Um, as we talked about what happens when you have direction, alignment, no commitment, and Catherine gave that great example with her teens. And I happened to mention about the laundry. Well, one of my daughters is actually viewing this session, and she came downstairs and she said, stop talking about me. So, hey, if you want to get um, commitment, public humiliation is the best way to do it. And then for icing on the cake, I asked her if she took the assessment and she said, no, I'm doing the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Oh, that might be in the malicious compliance passive category. <laughs> At this point, I'm taking what I can get, right? <laughs> All right, well, enough about me once again. We're going to go ahead and turn uh, to Emily. We're going to go ahead and turn to looking at our DAC assessment and learning how that's showing up in our groups. And we'd like to first start off with your lowest score. So we'd like to talk about your lowest score. And then we're also going to invite everyone that is uh, watching us to go ahead and put what their lowest component was in the chat. So if you could just enter direction, alignment, or commitment in the chat, that's your lowest component. While you're entering that, we're gonna we're gonna put the spotlight on Emily and ask her to share with us her lowest component. Definitely, yeah. So unfortunately, my lowest, I you I would be a great daughter to both of you. Commitment's my highest, but my lowest is direction. <laughs> direction. So tell us why, why do you think that is? So I think I I mean, I would think that potentially uh the viewers tuning in could um, relate to the fact that with everything shifting so much right now, direction, that that idea of being able to have a clear uh, focus of what to prioritize um, is, is a struggle right now. So, for example, the question that I had the lowest score on is okay. that I have a clear vision of what our group needs to achieve in the future. Um, so, I, as you guys know, we've had to massively pivot as an organization to be doing so much more in the virtual space during this time. So what that's meant for content marketing, um, it has been a, a huge pivot as well. Yeah. And I can only imagine that a lot of the people that are on have had to pivot as well. And Kathy even talked about a couple of her friends have had to pivot in their organization. And a lot of us are doing a, a lot more with less, right? There are a lot less resources that are um, afforded to organizations. And so that causes a lot of change in direction as well. Absolutely. So we're looking to, we're going to see what comes in in the, in the chat and what comes up with uh, other organizations. It looks like we got a couple people here. Here we go. Direction and alignment seem to be coming through. I'm seeing a lot of um, direction and alignment in the chat comments. Um, mm -hmm. I do see a couple of people saying that commitment is a challenge, but most people are in the direction and alignment mm -hmm. category, um, which is, uh, it's really telling, right? So th this goes back to kind of that engagement and discretionary effort and, it, and even or especially in a crisis, how right. people kind of come together and there's just tremendous esprit de corps, but toward what end? Like right. how do we channel all of that positive commitment energy and how critical it is then um, to, to offer that direction so that people know where to put their time. One of, the, one of, my, one of my favorite kind of um, examples of direction um, or stories, metaphors, I don't even know what to call it. Um, but I, I love to say that your direction should tell you that as I go through my day and I have an hour that maybe a meeting came off or just a found hour, that if the direction is clear and I have three things that I could do for the organization during that hour, that the direction helps me figure out which one of the three things I should do. Yeah. Yeah. And Emily, from your description, it sounds like right now, it, 
um, like so many organizations, we're, we're not just doing so much, but we have to experiment so much. Um, and that covers a whole lot of ground, doesn't it? For sure. And it's not only happening with us at work, but it ha it's happening with us at home. It's happening with us in our personal life. I mean, so many things have, have changed um, that we are looking for that direction in a lot of different areas. So it's compounded as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So then let's go to what is the highest score. So what I'd like to ask everyone to do now is to look at your scores. And once again, input in the chat, um, where is your highest component? And now we're going to turn back to you, Emily. What do you got? Yeah, so my highest, I'm over 20 in commitment. Um, so yeah, I really appreciated what you said, Catherine. I think that that's so accurate. There's so much enthusiasm and, um, you know, energy around being innovative and creative during this time. Um, so so that's great. That's a positive thing. Uh, it's just that a direction and alignment that seemed to um, be more difficult to bring with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people um, are going through kind of a reset right now, right? And then thinking about that commitment that you talked about and even being even more committed to um, things that they believe in, being even more committed to their family and being more committed to the um, environment. So I think just having this, this stillness, this time that we're, we're having now with COVID where we're not doing as much, it really is helping people to really focus in on those commitments and those priorities. Yeah, I'm... Um I sneaked over into the live comments um, just to check them out. We, as presenters, uh, we don't have all the live comments on because it, it it's distracting. There's so many comments and we love that. Um, but I just went over and peeked and it's like commitment, commitment, commit, commit, commitment, commitment, um, which I just said five times fast. I don't <laughs> that. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I do think that this speaks to if you can figure out how to channel that energy um, with better direction and alignment. And, and Emily, I love that you read out loud your the, the, the item that was lowest for you uh, because um, because that that diagnostic tool, that assessment can help you really hone in on where might I put some energy to move the needle? Um, so, so as I uh, reflect back to our question about how do I move my team from compliance to commitment, you can use this assessment and give this assessment to your team, have them complete it. I, I hope you've got a, a, a culture of trust that did come up elsewhere, mm -hmm. um, a culture of trust that people feel comfortable responding to that. And yes. then with those collective results, which by the way, absolutely have to share back the aggregate results to your team. Anytime we ask people to complete a survey um, and we don't feed them back the aggregate results, we can actually do, be doing more damage than if we had not administered the survey at all. So um, just a, a, a a tip there, um, but but giving out this assessment can be a huge advantage, and and then you can start to hone in on if you've only got compliance. That might give you some ideas about why that is and what you might shift to do that. And even if we start to hone that direction, and I'm trying to get on my camera. There we go. Even if we start to hone in that direction that we're this wide and we give it even just a little bit more direction. Um, that's going to give people a better sense of what do I need to say no to so that I can focus my time and effort where you want me to. But right. the human beings in general, man, they want to show up and do a good job. Um, I'll stop there. I can keep going. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're totally right. And I think when we're finding that with working from home, more and more people are saying that they're actually working more hours, right? They're really putting in more time because they don't have so much, like I said, the distractions. And so again, that be, the ability to be able to focus in on what are those big rocks, those big boulders that I really want to focus in on is important. Um, I keep going back to my laundry story. We had one of the participants actually say that he was doing his laundry. So he has focused in and determined that getting that laundry done today is really important for him and his family. And so people are making those decisions to every yep. single moment of the day. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. How about we flip to uh, some general questions? 
so we've got we've got some time to take some additional questions. And I thought I'd, I'd tackle that situation behavior impact. Those are the SBI model. Um, I thought I'd tackle the SBI model, just the briefest of explanations. Um, and so when we are teaching courses and, and giving feedback, gosh, uh, sorry, I have like 15 things popping in my head that I'd like to say, and I'm trying not to, um, I'm trying to stay coherent and not um, say all of them at once. Let me give a shout out to my colleague, Andre, who is going to be talking about communication and better conversations. I think that is at the two o'clock hour Eastern time. Um, so let me give a shout out because my guess is that he will also be talking about how do we have better conversations um, and incorporate developmental feedback and the situation behavior impact model may be included in that. I don't want to steal his thunder too much, um, but I'll do that shout out for two o'clock. Um, Eastern time. So when we teach courses at CCL and we're getting ready to introduce the delivery of feedback, um, I frequently will ask my group, um, how many of you give enough feedback? And nearly everybody in the room raises their hand, or if they're being honest, maybe it's about 50-50. And then I ask the question, so how many of you receive enough feedback? And, you know, the room falls silent. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I think it, I think that we are, we probably think that we're putting more feedback into the system than we think we are. And that is reflected by then our not getting sufficient feedback, especially a balance of positive feedback and developmental feedback. So, so that is why we think giving feedback, actually it's a, it's a key to that commitment piece. It builds trust that you recognize when I'm doing something well and you recognize and are ready to coach me when things are not going well. Um, and so we suggest the situation behavior impact model to deliver feedback situation is exactly what uh, what you think it is. So um, situation, uh, princess, you called me during our break um, to check in and uh, see how we were doing. Uh, the behavior, so the behavior is describing what that person did. One of the one of the substitutes I like to use for that or a metaphor I used to look, like to use for that is what would a video capture mm -hmm. um, of what that person did? Um, and so in this case, situ uh, the situation was princess. We talked during the uh, the um, break. The behavior was you shared some different ideas about how we might approach the second se session um, of our workshop and the impact on me. So that's the impact is the impact um, you you have. I felt excited, energized and inspired. Um, so that is situation behavior impact. Um, let me go back to uh, behavior for a second, because that is that is one of the places that people stumble. So a lot of times people might give feedback. Um, gosh, when we met in the office, the behavior was um, you were friendly and the impact was um, I felt included. Uh, if I give princess feedback that 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 her behavior is friendly, Princess doesn't know what to stop, start, or continue doing. She didn't know what, what um, made me feel included. But if I say, Princess, when we met in the office, you made eye contact with me, you shook my hand, maybe not in COVID era. Um, you waved to me from six feet away, <laughs> six meters away. You, um, you smiled, you asked me how my day was going. And the impact on me was I felt um, uh, included. Um, yeah. So, so here's the trick with SBI because it 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 is exquisitely simple. It's just as simple as you yes. uh, think it is. The challenge with giving feedback in organizations is most of the time 
feedback is formally delivered once or twice during the course of the year. And, you know, there's a feedback silence unless something goes horribly, horribly right, right. or horribly, horribly wrong um, in the rest of the year. Yes. And so the trick with the simplicity of SBI is how do you incorporate it daily into your leadership practice and in particular catch people doing things right so that when you need to coach them, they have a context of appreciation, recognition, and trust within which to hear that developmental feedback. Clearly, I could talk about this all day. <laughs> I have, in fact, in the past, but this is not the time or place. Princess, help save me. I'm talking. Well, you know what? This is. <laughs> This is actually a good transition to one of the questions that comes in, and it's asking about culture, because um, I think as you're talking about feedback, that is something that really differs within different cultures, right? So one person asked, how does um, DAC work differently in different cultures? Mm. Where some cultures, we know that there's more of a directional approach. Some cultures are more collaborative in nature. I, I would say go back to the definition that we use for leadership, which talks about it as a social process. And in being a social process, there is that need for people to work together, to agree upon the direction that they're moving in, um, to get aligned or coordinated on uh, what tasks they're going to do, and then to have a shared commitment or responsibility for how everyone else is doing. So I believe that it really does uh, belong in the space of collaboration. Um, and I think, you know, between on the culture, that could differ on how that plays out in the workplace. Absolutely. Hey, I'm seeing a question I'd love to grab that about um, what the right balance of authoritative and collaborative leadership when trying to establish uh, direction, alignment, commitment. Um, and so certainly, perhaps especially in times of crisis, um, let, me, let me back up. I'm going to back up and give you another metaphor. So one of the metaphors I use for leadership is um, we all, perhaps you don't, and I certainly don't at the Center for Creative Leadership, but some leaders. And somebody else's organization, right? They do this. Somebody else's organization right. fits the description I have of if um, if all you're holding is a hammer, mm -hmm. then everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. And so we have leaders throughout who are holding their hammer and everything looks like a nail. And some people are holding an authoritative hammer. Some people are uh, holding a participative hanger, hammer. Some people are holding a collaborative or um, yeah, collaborative hammer. Uh, I, you know, so, so part of what you wanna think about as a leader with direction alignment commitment is how do you become a more versatile leader so mm -hmm. that you don't just have a hammer in your hand, right. but you also have I don't know. You have um, I know these have different terms in um, different cultures. So my, my apologies. My my frame is American uh, <laughs> driver and a wrench and mm -hmm. a chainsaw, because sometimes you need a chainsaw yeah. and a feather duster, because sometimes you need a feather duster. So <laughs> the key to good leadership is knowing which tool to use or having the tool, all the tools to use and knowing which which one is required at any given time. Yeah, I would suggest that if the hammer you are holding is an authoritative hammer, that that is not going to engender the kind of commitment you need, sustainable commitment you need long term. Right. I would also suggest that in times of crisis, um, the collaborative leader who is holding a um, who is holding a collaborative hammer that if there is, if you're in an emergency room in, in a hospital, that that is not the time to gather all the staff and say, so what do you think we should do? I'd love to hear from everybody that that's a time for some clearer direction mm -hmm. um, that hopefully you have laid collaborative groundwork with the team before the emergency happens mm -hmm. so that when you need to shift gears and use a different leadership style mm -hmm. that you're able to kind of move into that and people people trust you and they know what you're doing when you're doing that 
And we actually have the privilege of having another section coming up after this where we're actually going to talk about collaboration and authoritative ideas. And Alice, Bill, and Mike are going to take us through that presentation next. So I would tell everyone just to stay put and actually stay, stay here for that part of the presentation. Ab absolutely. Absolutely. Good deal. Um, I'm scrolling through. Uh, I got one for us. So here's a question that talks about organizational culture. So it seems like we're on a, a kind of a culture thing here. Yes. So if someone asks, uh, what happens with DAC and how is it impacted by organizational culture? You know, when you have, you know, we know that people make up the culture. And as we're talking about how people have commitment, alignment and direction that can be impacted by the environment that they're in and what's rewarded or not rewarded, as you even talked about with the SBI example, when those behaviors are rewarded, they flourish and in environments where they're not, they don't. So I think organizational culture has a big impact on the sustainability of being able to sustain DAC. What do you think, Catherine? Uh, absolutely. Um, I, I don't want to steal thunder from our, our keynote um, at one o'clock Eastern with uh, Alice and Bill and Mike, who will be talking all kinds of um, all kinds of organizational culture and how that impacts leadership in crisis, um, but but it absolutely does. Now, one of the things that I like to think about, um, having held a variety of roles at a variety of different levels at the Center for Creative Leadership, is um, you referenced it earlier, kind of your sphere of control, mm -hmm. your sphere of influence, and then as the model suggests, the stuff that you, re it's hard to let go of, but sometimes you just gotta let go of it. It, it certainly doesn't need to be taking up a whole lot of your mental real estate because mm -hmm. there's not a whole lot you can do about it. And so even if an organizational culture is not um, what you would want it to be, how do you thoughtfully create a culture for a team um, to help them perform, even if your organizational culture is not there. So, are there are there opportunities for you to create direction, alignment, commitment, um, kind of a pocket, uh, a, a best practice, a community of best practice in your organization, mm -hmm. when the rest of the organization may or may not be on board or be a culture that you're interested in. That does tie back to what John Ryan talked about, about resilience. Yeah. Because if you are creating a, a positive culture with your team in a larger culture that may or may not be aligned with that, there's buffering work that you as a leader have to do that will take a physical, emotional, mental, and psychological toll so all that stuff that John Ryan talked about um, this morning comes double into play when you have to have to hold yeah. that safe space for your team. And and that is the work of leadership. Right. Yeah. And that that really that goes really well into this question that we have where people say who should be included in mm -hmm. DAC. I think you just answered that when you said that is the work of leadership. That is the work of leaders. Mm -hmm. um, that's how we know that leadership is actually taking place. It's actually when you have the D, the A and the C actually overlapping, you have all present. I think Emily talked about the three legs of a stool. Right. And so you can sit on that when you have that stability. Well, in leadership, you can have leadership when you have those three things working together. And so leaders definitely should be involved in that. Anyone else that you can think of that you would say specifically leaders, co-workers, well, teams? If, absolutely. So if we think about leadership as a collective process, as a, mm -hmm. as a social process, then the more you can get more leaders of the team in, or, or colleagues involved, uh, the more likely it is that you're going to get that commitment that gets that discretionary effort. Um, one of the um, when when people are not when people are not involved in the creation of the direction and and believe me, so um, I, I'm not say, I'm not saying that everybody's voice has to be represented because if you have to wait for every single voice and for everybody to get on board, um, then you're moving too slowly, right? So there's, so, so there's got to be a balance there of inclusion and speed. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but the more that you can get other people involved in the creation of the direction, even if they don't agree with it, if they can understand where it came from and why it is, um, in commitment, there's a, I, I like to say there's a difference between buying in and being committed. Because if I'm given a direction and I buy into it, I can sell out of it at any moment. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. but, if, but if I'm committed, there's a different level of um, connection to that direction. And I'm back to discretionary effort. There's more discretionary effort I'm more likely to bring than if I'm bought in and waiting to see kind of what, what's happening. Right. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I think we have maybe one more question here, and it says, what do you do when your senior leaders are actually the obstacle to DAC? <laughs> We're hitting on the senior leaders today, aren't we? We are. We are. Um, you go. Do, do you have thoughts? Well, I was just thinking about the, the last thing you talked about, with, which is the inclusion part. Um, and I think you also hit on this earlier about just the senior leaders having so much coming at them. And so... I'll give them the benefit of the doubt and say that not necessarily the obstacle because they're being malicious about it, but there's an obstacle because they have so many things that are coming at them and they yeah. feel responsible for every part of the organization that maybe they need to focus. Maybe they need to focus on those things that are those big rocks to move the organization forward. And they need input for that. Right? They really do need their mid-level leaders to be able to communicate and to talk to them about what's going on in the organization to help them really focus on some of more of the priorities. So I think, um, really trying to increase their, their direction by being involved and giving them information is something that would be helpful. What do you think, Catherine? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I am aware culturally, so I'm talking organization culture, I'm talking country culture, I'm talking region culture, I'm talking all kinds of culture about approaching the hierarchy. So some mm -hmm. Some cultures are more hierarchical than others. Some are more collaborative. So nothing we're saying today um, really changes uh, what you know about your organization. Um, so I, I, I don't want people to like just mm -hmm. go like um, skipping into their senior leadership's office and say, hey, I attended this thing on direction alignment commitment and if I got some news for you. Um, <laughs> Uh, but so, so I think taking care and and creating those moments of awareness, mm -hmm. um, whether they are explicit or subtle and implicit, can start to move the needle. And then, how do you focus the majority on of your energy on how do you create direction, alignment, and commitment for your team? If 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 that's the unit that you have the most control over then that's the unit where you yeah. start. I, um, Emily um, probably has, an, has never seen this, but I'm gonna, I can't figure out which way to turn on this thing. So behind me is the center's very first marketing campaign that, oh. now I was around for that because I, you know, dinosaurs roaming the earth and that kind of thing. <laughs> but um, our, our uh, you know, we have now a tagline of leadership never stops, which is absolutely true, right? It's even more important now. Our tagline then was the path to greatest impact begins within yourself. Hmm. Um, and so that's the that that was our very first marketing campaign. Uh, so what I would encourage everyone to do who is uh, with us and thank you for staying with us and being with us um, is while we change our teams, our businesses, our uh, organizations, the world, there's some really important things going on around the world right now um, that, that I love that tagline, the path of greatest impact begins within yourself. Um, and so would invite uh, all of you to kind of feel that inspiration and recognize it begins with you. Yeah, I appreciate uh, that. Anything you would anything you would add? 
I was just saying I so appreciate that. And I know that we're running short of time and there's lots of different things we can talk about in regards to things that we have for the center. And so we just ask people to reach out. You know, we're going to continue to monitor some of the questions that are coming through along yeah. LinkedIn and, and post some comments and questions and, you know, just really, you know, have a good time with this. And so we encourage people to continue to take this conversation. I think it's a very uh, helpful one. For sure. Well, yes, as uh, Princess just said, we are coming up on time, but I want to thank you both so much for taking 90 minutes to share your wisdom, go through the direction alignment commitment model, and um, encourage the people tuning in to access that free self-assessment that we think can really spark some powerful conversations on your teams. And Catherine, I, I love a good vintage marketing campaign <laughs> that that is super interesting and really um, applicable how well that original tagline ties to some of the things that we're going to be talking about this afternoon. Um, so right now, if, if you are joining us um, in the Eastern time zone, we're going to take a bit of a break. We encourage you to grab lunch, if that makes sense, or maybe grab breakfast if you're on the West Coast, um, but really encourage you to join us back here in an hour. The keynote session with Alice Cahill, Mike Smith, and Bill Pasmore is going to show up in a separate stream, and we're starting right at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'm really excited. All the questions we are getting in this session related to culture and culture transformation, because that's really going to be the focus of that session. And this idea of the key to turning challenges into opportunities being um, about shifting your culture to be a more collaborative one. Mm -hmm. So a really nice build on what we've been talking about this morning. But um, thank you all for joining us. This uh, has been a great start to the day, and we're looking forward to continuing it. And again, thank you, Catherine and Princess, for sharing all these great insights with us. Thank you everyone for giving us the gift of your time. We really appreciate it. We do. Thank you.